Hello, I'm Karen Chilton, author of the biography of one of America's preeminent artists, Hazel Scott, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the first in a series of events that we at Washington Performing Arts are calling Hazel 101. These events are a kind of introductory course on who Hazel Scott was and what constitutes her greatness. Born in Port of Spain, Trinidad, if Hazel were with us tonight, she would be 101 years old. So again, Hazel at 101, the Hazel Scott 101st birthday celebration. A classical pianist, a jazz instrumentalist and singer, a civil rights activist and an actor, Hazel Scott was one of the most famous black women of her era. Her cohort of peers were some of the biggest names in the business, including Billie Holiday, Lena Horne, Dizzy Gillespie, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, and the list goes on and on. She was a great artist, a great beauty, and by the time she was 20 years old, a great star, headlining at New York City's first integrated nightclub, Cafe Society, and appearing in more than a half dozen films for Columbia Pictures and MGM, here are a few moments that show her virtuosity, her irresistible personality, her glamour, and her passion for making music. That brilliant career came to an abrupt end in 1950, and the timing couldn't have been worse. At the moment that Hazel made television history, becoming the first African American to host her own show, her stand for racial justice caught up with her. She was blacklisted during the McCarthy era. Though she was married to the crusading black politician from Harlem, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., the first black congressman from the East Coast, Hazel's career hung in the balance, but more about that later. Right now, I'd love to tell you about the inspiration for this evening. When I began my deep dive into researching Hazel Scott's life and music over 15 years ago, what I discovered was a child prodigy who trained at the prestigious Juilliard School of Music at eight years old, 
when the entry age was 16. A young girl who hosted her own radio show at 14 on WOR in New York had performed on Broadway at 18 and by 19 she had achieved worldwide fame in the classical and jazz worlds, known as the darling of cafe society. So I wondered how and why did the legacy of an artist so brilliant, so sought after, become lost in history? The biography was, of course, a way to wipe away decades of dust on Hazel Scott's contributions. And we continue our unearthing of her great legacy in this celebration of her centennial plus one. I'd like to acknowledge our great partners who have collaborated with us in this endeavor, the United States Air Force Band's Symphony Orchestra under the leadership of Colonel Don Schofield. In the rarefied world of European classical music, much of the acclaim, historically, has been bestowed upon a coterie of artists who are mostly white and mostly male. It's certainly not a world known for its diversity. Nevertheless, important contributions to classical music have been made by African-American composers for centuries, from the 18th century composer Chevalier de Saint-Georges, to William Grant Still and Samuel Coleridge Taylor, from Margaret Bonds to Florence Price. And though they may have been underappreciated in years past, there is now a kind of resurgence underway, a renewed interest in these artists among contemporary performers, anxious to introduce their compositions to a new audience. One of those performers is our featured soloist. Her own formidable presence on the concert stage has helped to break down barriers and change the face of classical music today. The Boston Music Intelligencer called her a compelling, sparkling virtuoso. The pianist Michelle Kahn made her orchestral debut at age 14 and has since performed as a soloist with numerous orchestras including the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Cleveland Orchestra, the Cincinnati Symphony, and the New Jersey Symphony. A champion of the music of Florence Price, Miss Kahn performed the New York City premiere of the composer's Piano Concerto in One Movement with the Dream Unfinished Orchestra in July 2016 and the Philadelphia premiere with the Philadelphia Orchestra under the direction of Yannick Nezé Seguin in February of last year. Ms. Can holds bachelor's and master's degrees in piano performance from the Cleveland Institute of Music and an artist diploma from the Curtis Institute of Music, where she holds the inaugural Eleanor Sokoloff Chair in Piano Studies. Michelle, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Good to be here. You began playing the piano at a really young age. At what point did you decide that you wanted to pursue a professional career in classical music? Uh, yes, I, I started at seven. And mm -hmm. uh, really, I think, where I really felt the ownership of, you know, pursuing a career in, mm -hmm. in piano um, and, and in music in general, it was probably around 14, and that, mm. that was completely connected to um, a pivotal discussion that I had with mm -hmm. my parents. You know, I was a typical teenager. I was a typical kid in so many ways where, uh -huh. you know, I, I didn't want to have to always put the work in, right. but I enjoyed it so much. So I remember when I was 14, my parents called me into their room and basically said, we are very, we're tired of, feeling like we have to force you to go practice, you know, remind you, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by this point, I've already done various competitions. I've been, mm. you know, I'm quite advanced already. Mm -hmm. And they said, this is up to you. You know, do you want this or not? Because mm -hmm. we're, we don't want to keep trying to push you and make you do it. So if you don't want it, okay, then we'll just quit the lessons and we'll do. And, you know, that that's an important thing to do for children, whether it's a teacher, mm -hmm. parent, or mm -hmm. whoever is that eventually you have to put the ownership into their hands. Right. And when I was faced with that mm -hmm. reality and that option and thought about it, I realized, no, no, I, I don't want to lose this. You know, mm -hmm. I, I do love this, you know, and and that helped so much in changing the direction as I finished high school um, of my practice, of my focus. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's the direction I went. 
What did learning about black women musicians and composers like Hazel Scott, Mary Lou Williams, Margaret Bonds, Florence Price, what did learning about them and their contributions do to you as a young musician? How did they inform your work? Uh, it's a great question, and I have to answer it first by saying I wonder what it would have done for me if I knew about these amazing women in black women in classical music mm -hmm. much sooner in my life. <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> because you, it, the absolute truth is that I was not aware of these names until after college, after a master's degree. I mean, yeah. I didn't even hear the name Florence Price until 2016. Mm. And then Margaret Bonds after that. I was not, wow. I think I had heard, especially with Margaret Bonds, she wrote a lot of vocal rep, um, mm -hmm. uh, voice and piano. So since I wasn't necessarily involved in that rep in college, I'll admit maybe I'd heard a couple of pieces sung okay. that had the Margaret Bonds name. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time <laughs> in a lesson that was taught in college mm -hmm. where we got maybe one one day that was devoted to all woman composers <laughs> oh, and i think her name was in the list and it was and that was it wow. and um so this kind of um you know education or at least what's offered mm -hmm. generally mm -hmm. um it just leaves a lot of names out and we know this anyway in history that right. you know the history books will tell us what they want to tell us and then mm -hmm. other stories aren't being heard role models are so important yeah. see someone that looks like you you're a black child and you yeah. see another black artist or you mm -hmm. know woman or man um, who's achieved those things in the field that you want to go into then you believe that there is a place for you a fire that definitely came into me once I became aware mm -hmm. of these names of Florence Price mm -hmm. of Margaret Bonds I remember quite frankly when I was asked to be part of this project mm -hmm. and I was told about your book about yeah. Hazel Scott and I, I and I ordered it and when when I was first asked to be part of this project I truly did not know very much about Hazel Scott mm -hmm. I knew the iconic picture of her with uh, the two pianos, pianos right and that always is you know shared and that she was really just this gorgeous and yeah. amazing you know jazz pianist and that was mm -hmm. the identity I knew of her and that was about it yeah. and um, reading your book I find out and this was the first time I was aware of this, was how when she came from Trinidad and she was already playing piano, mm -hmm. that she starts at Juilliard. Right. And that... At eight years old. At eight years old, she's playing Rachmaninoff. And yeah. I had no idea. I remember this moment of elation yeah. because on some level, and I mean, of course, I would have still been equally impressed if she was never doing classical music. But for everyone, what do we get excited about? We get excited when we find those similarities. Right. And so right. by seeing that, okay, so she was this child that was seriously studying the classical repertoire mm -hmm. as, as I did as a child and seeing the legitimate, sort of the legitimacy of that, the fact that she really was, if she wanted to be, if yeah. she wanted to go the route of being a classical pianist and doing just classical repertoire, she, she would have been amazing right there. Right, right. Like right. that was enough. It was and enough. It, and, yes. and it's so interesting, even in, in writing about her, I started discovering even more black women. I mean, yes. you know, you sort of right. fall into this rabbit hole, <laughs> but you have a special affinity for Florence Price. Yes. What, since you, you said you just found out about her in 2016, what was, your, I'm curious to know what your reaction was when you first heard one of her compositions. Yes, um, I remember it vividly. I was called in 2016 by um, a colleague of mine who is, he works with the Dream Unfinished. Uh, symphony orchestra that's based mm -hmm. in New York City and and this is it, it's a smaller orchestra they're very focused on um, I would say just um, activism and mm -hmm. and black rights and especially at that time uh, Black Lives Matter movement and and there were so many different issues that they like to highlight um, not only in their concerts through speakers that would speak about issues but also through activism through music and, uh -huh. and through presenting mm -hmm. um, music of um, composers that have been marginalized so this was a very special event and they were trying to focus on black female composers and mm -hmm. also black female musicians to um, to um, bring this music to life mm -hmm. so at any rate he calls me and says there's this piece 
um, the Florence Price Piano Concerto in One Movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told them about you and said, you know, you'd be great for this and, you know, can you learn this? There's about like maybe two months. I mean, there wasn't <laughs> much time. And I remember um, I said, that first reaction was, who's that? You know, and I'm just racking my brain and I'm starting to remember maybe that one time in music history class that they mentioned her name. <laughs> and I'm, you know, and then the next question is, okay, well, you know, what is this piece? And I said, well, you know, and he had told me it was written in the 30s. So I thought, well, I don't know how good this is. If, if no one's playing it right. for all this time, it mm -hmm. might not be that good. And I just had skepticism. Mm -hmm. And I remember that he sent me the music and I was reading through it, just sight reading it. And I finished, and I finished it, and I get back on the phone with my friend, and I said to him, "This is amazing." Wow. I said, "I said, I can't believe." Like you got to tell me more. Yeah, like right. why? You know why has this been lost? And he mm -hmm. only knew so much at the time, but I remember he said the same thing. He said, "I know, isn't it great?" And I was just, just really shocked. I thought. Mm -hmm. I've got to find out more about this lady because this yeah. is really something else. So with enthusiasm, I learned the concerto at that time. And I did that first performance in New York City. And I'll never forget, there's this feeling mm -hmm. of, you know, you're excited about it, but mm -hmm. you know that the whole audience doesn't know it. Right. And so you still have, I wonder if mm. they'll be excited by this or mm. if they're just going to have this reaction of like, oh, it's okay, you know, good story uh -huh. and move on with their life. And I remember we finished that first performance and there's that, that moment of silence that you get in a live concert. And it really is a split second, but it feels longer uh -huh. when you've gotten to the end of the piece. Now remember, because no one knows the piece. So ah. sometimes there's a moment that they're not sure if it's over. Right. Just in case, right? Because right. they've right. never right. heard it. So there's that split moment, second of silence. And I remember that the applause that I heard and it was one of the most roaring and loud applause I've ever gotten in, oh, in any concert. And wow. everyone jumped to their feet. And I remember I had a friend in the audience and he said, I've never experienced anything like this. I mean, it was just reverberating. People were so excited by this piece. Wow. So excited. And, wow. and that just, I was so happy because I thought this is what she deserves. Yeah. It wasn't just me. This is amazing. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, and everybody needs to hear this. And so, um, that really was uh, the beginning. And all I could do from there was just look up more pieces for piano and everything mm -hmm. I find is just gold. Well, we're so thrilled that you're here and that we're gonna get <laughs> yeah. to hear some of this. And this conversation, I mean, I feel like we could talk forever. We, we, there's so, it's so rich and it's so interesting. And I think when, when we share these different histories of these and we unearth these legacies of yes. these amazing artists, the conversation just goes on and on and on. Yes, so this, to be continued. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, absolutely. <laughs> so now, ladies and gentlemen, here is the original 1934 version of Florence Price's Piano Concerto on One Movement, the United States Air Force Band Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Colonel Don Schofield, with our soloist, Michelle Kahn.
For African-American artists, it has never been enough to be a virtuoso. You've had to persevere through incredible odds, and so many great artists join the struggle for racial justice, as so many continue to do today. It was especially true for conservatory-trained classical musicians like Florence Price and Hazel Scott. Though she didn't necessarily like what she called the activist tag, Hazel Scott began her fight against discrimination and all forms of injustice quite early in her career. For those fortunate enough to have a platform, she believed it came with responsibility. She had it written in her contracts that she would not perform before segregated audiences. When she went to Hollywood, she made it clear that she would never play the role of a maid or a subservient character. And just in case producers didn't catch her meaning, she insisted on wearing her own gowns and jewels and would be billed only as Hazel Scott as herself. In 1945, Hazel married Adam Clayton Powell Jr., pastor of the famous Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem and the newly elected congressman from Harlem. Together, they were the most celebrated black couple in the country. Their wedding was featured in Life magazine and their travels across the globe were covered by the international press. While Hazel performed on concert stages across Europe, Congressman Powell visited American troops overseas as he worked on legislation in the House of Representatives to desegregate the armed forces. A powerful duo, two titanic personalities, who together, Hazel believed, will do great things for our people. And who better to discuss the dynamic lives of Hazel Scott and Adam Clayton Powell Jr., but their son, Adam Powell III. Adam, to the world, Hazel was this vivacious, beautiful, glamorous performer at the piano. But to you, that was mom. Yeah, she what, was mom. How different was her personality on stage and off? Not that different, actually. Of course, <laughs> she wasn't made up, and her hair was, you know, maybe uh, under a scarf or something, but, but she wasn't that different. Uh, she was uh, vivacious. She was very, um, she was very stubborn if she thought she was right. And, for example, her hands were insured by Lloyds of London for a million dollars, which would be, what, 10 million today. Wow. Um, but part of the insurance policy was she could not engage in any athletics, she couldn't cook, she couldn't do anything which, as she put it, she said, I can't do anything fun. <laughs> so what did she do? She simply, uh, she said, well, you know, those are really suggestions. <laughs> so the Ellington band would come over for dinner and she'd make a big pot of red beans and rice. Oh uh, uh, they, there was apparently a big deal about her not playing tennis because of what could happen to her wrists. Oh. So she said, okay, I won't play tennis. Instead, she was out in the street playing football with the neighborhood kids. Oh my goodness. Now, she's the only non-boy out, out there on the street. <laughs> so of course they would all want to, even though it was supposed to be touch football, maybe it was heavy touch football, um, but she would um, uh, curl up her hands and, and, and protect them. Uh, wow. So uh, she was uh, also very much the, uh, the, the civil rights advocate uh, at home as much as uh, uh, in public. In fact, I always knew that uh, I could always find out where she was in the house if I went to the piano and played Rule Britannia. And she would shout from wherever she was, mm -hmm. no, we're free. One of the high point, well, not the high point, I would say one of the low points of the career, of course, was the HUAC hearing and her being blacklisted. And she mentions in her diary that, she, I think the quote was, the idea that my career was stopped has, has just, you know, has really done me in. And I wondered if she ever shared with you in later years what that period of time was like. In 1950, when she appeared before the House Un-American Activities Committee and then soon after that, you guys became expatriates and moved to Paris. But did she ever talk about what it meant to her to stand up for herself and her community and what she felt it cost her? Well, I can remember uh, at the time of the, uh, uh, before she went to the House on American Activities Committee, she had agreed to go. Uh, she and my father and I were having dinner at the dinner table. And my father said, you're crazy. 
you can never beat these people. You won't win. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'm right. It doesn't matter. I'm right. Wow. And, uh, and so she went, and we know what happened. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, we went to Paris, and obviously uh, it was very different. Mm -hmm. and she was the vedette américaine, the, uh, <laughs> the American star. Mm -hmm. And so uh, she would be uh, on a bill where she would close the first half, mm -hmm. and you'd have a, a major French star closing the second half. But at home, again, she was, uh, uh, she was really mom. She mm -hmm. uh, 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 cooked, uh, sewed, did all those things she wasn't supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, she never really showed me at the time uh, the impact that obviously had on her career and on her. Right. I remember one story you told me about um, coming home from school and James Baldwin would be on the sofa, Quincy Jones would be in the kitchen, <laughs> and the apartment became like a salon for American artists. Oh, absolutely. She uh, said after she uh, came back to the States, she said, you know, in Paris, your mother had a salon and didn't know it. <laughs> because it wasn't just uh, James Baldwin, Quincy Jones, and, and, uh, and other Americans, but also uh, French artists and musicians and mm -hmm. sculptors and writers. Uh, uh, so it was uh, very much a uh, very much a salon. Wow. One, I mean, it's clear that Hazel was passionate about her own music, and I remember reading in her journals how she had all of these aspirations. She wanted to write an opera and she wanted to compose more. But one of the um, composers who she loved was Gershwin. What do you recall about her affinity for Gershwin's music? Well, her final, uh, her, her last movie that she did in the 40s in Hollywood uh, was Rhapsody in Blue, where mm -hmm. uh, Robert Alta, uh, Alan Alda's father, wow. uh, plays George Gershwin. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother uh, plays the owner of a, uh, of a cafe in Paris, an entertainment venue in Paris, and she welcomes him, uh, Gershwin, to Paris. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time, she'd never been to Paris. Oh. Uh, so it was an interesting uh, sort of preview of what would happen later in her life. Uh, but uh, she uh, liked the film. She always uh, liked Gershwin. The first time I heard her play with the symphony orchestra, I think I was four years old, uh, she was um, playing uh, uh, Gershwin's Concerto in F. Mm. Um, and, uh, and of course, the other thing that she uh, loved to play and loved to hear different people playing, different performances, was uh, Rhapsody in Blue. Oh, gorgeous. Her performance in that film is so amazing. And it's one of the few times we see her standing center stage singing away from the piano. And I think she's wearing a tiara, which is very Hazel Scott. <laughs> um, thank you, Adam, for joining us and sharing these wonderful anecdotes about your mother. And this gives me the opportunity to thank you publicly for your generosity and all that you contributed to the book because without you and your family, I don't think that I could have written the biography. So a hearty thank you. Thank you. Uh, you spent, uh, what, eight years, I think, writing it? Yeah, and, lost uh, track. And that really uh, came at a time when uh, uh, she was less known than she is now. So thank you.
We hope this has been the kind of event Hazel would have loved. And we certainly wouldn't be here if it weren't for her and her artistic contributions to the music and entertainment industries and to our country as a whole. The works of women like Hazel Scott and Florence Price are here to inspire us and to teach us what it means to be an artist and a citizen, to pursue excellence, and in that pursuit, be a champion for justice. Our thanks to Adam Powell III for being here and to our wonderful guest pianist, Ms. Michelle Can. Thank you for joining us. You know, Hazel had a word she often used to describe something that was truly exceptional and gratifying, particularly when it came to music. If she really loved a performance, she'd say it was devastating. So thank you for a truly devastating performance. And now we end with a work that turns 98 years old this winter. It premiered in New York City on February 12, 1924. Our finale, George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, with the United States Air Force Band Symphony Orchestra, led by Colonel Don Schofield, with our guest soloist, Michelle Cass.